which means that the only thing to do is make a huge amount of noise for Marta Marcel from Remember to Play, please. Um, Where are you? Okay, let's start. So, this is me 18 years ago, when I was 16. Um, yeah, I look a bit different. I had short hair and these heavy boots, because I thought that I need to show that I'm a rebel. Now I think I don't need to show it anymore. I still am. Um, but this is an important moment in my life, because at that time I was applying for high school, and on the application there was a question that made me look like this. And the question was something around, um, what would you like to be when you grow up? And how can you ask a question like this to a 16-year-old? I mean, do you really want to make that decision when you're 16? Um, but I took that question very serious, and I went out and I did some research, and I talked to some people, and then after a few sleepless nights, I arrived at three options that I thought I was passionate about. So it was architecture, visual communication, and computer sciences. And I had trouble deciding which one I would go for. Computer sciences seemed to be interesting for me because I thought I would do cool stuff with computers, I would have to do math and physics, which I was always interested in. But then I thought also that hmm, probably this is not going to be so creative. At least I thought at that time. Um, so I wasn't sure whether this would be the right thing for me. On the other hand, visual communication was tempting because it seemed that I'm going to be able to explore my creativity. I cannot turn my head, this is so strange. Um, so I wouldn't be able to explore my, uh, so I would be able to explore my creativity, but then on the other hand I thought, well, will there be any analytical thinking? Where am I going to do math and physics? And I thought, probably not, it's going to be like very artistic. So then in the end I decided to go for architecture, because it seemed like a, a perfect combination of the two worlds, arts and engineering. Um, so in the end I believe that architecture is like applied arts. Oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Um, so the way I decided, that's what I did. So I studied architecture, uh, in Zurich, and then I, after completing my studies, I moved to Turkey, to Istanbul, where I started working for a young and progressive um, architecture firm, and I stayed with them for five years. Um, but after five years, as an architect, I got actually quite frustrated about this profession. And I'm not going to um, go into details about the frustration, because the point is that I decided to quit architecture and pursue my second passion. So I went on to try, what if I become a visual communicator? And the story goes on and on, and then, you know, many things happen on the way. But the point is that today, 18 years later, after I had this initial um, dilemma, um, I managed to combine all of these three passions. And this is exactly what Remember to Play does. So we're combining, like, all of this knowledge that I learned and the experiences that I gained as an architect with um, the creativity and arts parts of visual communication, but also the engineering um, and the technical knowledge from um, computer sciences. Okay, so that's the story. And why did I tell you this story? Um, it's because um, for the last years I've been working, or at Remember to Play, we keep working with uh, companies that, do, um, that are active in the field of programmable infrastructure. And I do believe that coming from a different background, um, I have observations that might be interesting. And I believe that um, uh, software can learn from architecture. So why should software learn from architecture? Well, I see there are two main reasons for that. So let's look a bit at, at history. So if you look at the history of architecture, you can see that already 10,000 before Christ, uh, humans started building houses. This is somewhere in the Levant, like current uh, Turkey, where humans started building housing out of mud, bricks, and stone. 
It was very, very primitive at that time. And then we have like 8,000 before Christ, we have the pyramids, um, then 72 there is the Colosseum, and so on and so on. But if you look at this timeline, you will see that um, computer engineering, like the first computer, is 1948. Yeah? And this is when uh, in architecture we already had glass, steel, concrete, even reinforced concrete, and Manhattan was already full with skyscrapers. Um, so if you look at this, for fast forward here, uh, if you look at this here, then um, I think it's very obvious uh, that computer science is a relatively young domain. <laughs> I think it's, <laughs> to put it actually mildly. <laughs> so, um, I think this is, amongst others, one reason why maybe it's uh, interesting to learn from your older brother or maybe even your like, grand, grand, grandfather. Uh, because I'm sure there is a reason why you call yourself software architects. Um, then there is a second reason that I see. Um, working with uh, software engineers uh, I started seeing that you guys actually experience a very similar challenge. So the challenge is like how do you go from an abstract idea in your head to something that is actually functional and real. So in, term, in the case of architecture these are buildings, like uh, real artifacts that you can touch, they are there, you can go inside. Um, and in, in the case of software engineering it's uh, it's obviously it's software and it's, easy, it's more difficult to touch, but you can still experience it through the interaction with it or through user interfaces. Um, so this is, uh, this is a shared challenge. Um, I see also shared frustrations. Um, and these frustrations are very often related to um, difficulties to communicate about the work that we do. Um, as an example, I will tell you, like when I worked as an architect and I remember my sister coming to me and saying, hey, so you sit the whole day at the office and you're basically drawing how they should like put the bricks on top of each other? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, like not really, but kind of. Um, and I can imagine that you have similar situations where someone just asks, oh, so you're basically like coding, coding all day long. Um, or people coming and saying, hey, we just bought a new apartment and uh, would you come over and have a look at our living room and can you tell us a bit like where we should put the lighting and what colors we should choose? And that's kind of when you have your, I don't know, your uh, auntie coming and saying, hey, my computer is broken, can you help me to fix it? Um, so there are parallels. So. Um, I find it very interesting uh, to, to, to discover these uh, similarities while working with uh, developers. Mm. Okay, so I hope that's proof enough to say that it's worth to look at uh, architecture and what architects do. So let's see what we can uh, learn from architects and the way they, um, they design and the way they face these challenges. Uh, so, just briefly to explain the typical design process of an architect, you start with a concept. This is usually about like big ideas, um, like how does the building work, what is the shape, what is the size, how is it located on the site. It's, uh, it's, it's very often, um, it becomes tangible, but it's still very abstract. So, um, here I'm going to uh, just show a few minutes. In the design development phase, uh, you start asking more detailed questions. So you start talking to structural engineers, um, to, uh, you start looking at materials you want to use, um, and trying to really uh, to detail the building, to find a way to slowly get it ready for construction. Um, and then in the, uh, in the construction drawing phase, you're actually really preparing very detailed drawings. Like this is, um, this is, this is a drawing of um, like an architectural detail. Very often uh, these details are prepared in a scale 1 to 5 or sometimes even 1 to 1 if they're very complicated. 
Um, so basically at this point you prepare all of the document documentation that is uh, needed for the con uh, construction company to actually get that thing built. And then there is the construction administration, which means that uh, architects actually are on site with uh, the construction people and they oversee parts of the constructions. If it's an easy uh, building, then you may be on the construction site once a week. Uh, if it's very complex, like in case of this building, uh, which was quite innovative, basically the architect is on site all the time and has to supply um, the contractor with on, ongoingly with drawings to clarify questions that come up during the construction. And um, also like working with uh, IT companies, I see that there are some similarities uh, to the design process that you're going through. So um, how do architects actually solve like the different communication problems they have along the way or that not even communication problems but also problems related to, um, uh, to the design itself. So the solution is uh, visuals, in like in the case of architecture. And um, architect, uh, like there, there, are many, um, there are many cases where architects use visuals, but I'm going to talk about eight specific cases. So one is uh, where, so the first one is where uh, visuals are used to envision the future. Um, then we're going to look at explaining difficult concepts. Um, how can you um, use visuals and design to experiment and prototype, um, to understand the context, to talk about complexity, to talk about even more complexity, um, about how to build that stuff, <laughs> and how to sell it. Um, so I'm going to show examples for each of these uh, cases. And I'm going to show an example from architecture, followed by an example um, from software engineering. So from the, the work that we're doing at Remember to Play, to just show you how a similar um, case can be made in software development. So let's start with envisioning the future. This is an example of a drawing from a, a French architect who in 1780 had an idea for a building like this. So just to give you a bit of context, at that time, what was happening in architecture was this. So his idea was quite revolutionary. You have to imagine that in 1780, it was only 20 years after someone started experimenting with concrete. Um, and on top of that, this building was supposed to be a monument for Newton. So you see here actually, like all architecture at that time in Europe was, or the main buildings and everything that was grand and big, it was like church. So to, um, you know, for God basically. And here this guy comes and he says, let's build a mon monument for a scientist. Um, so he made these amazing uh, visuals to tell his story and to explain his big ideas. Um, and something similar can be done uh, in, um, in software engineering. So this is a visualization of a very innovative idea uh, by container solutions where you can see um, how, <laughs> okay, this is difficult to explain. Um, so here we see clusters of services that interfere with, with each other. So you have, uh, basically the, the main idea here is to say software uh, is moving towards an organic world. Um, next example, so how do you explain difficult concepts? So what architects do very often is to use analogies. So that's an example of a building in Bulgaria that actually has been executed, where the bu building behaves somehow like a tree. So it draws its energy from, from the ground. And making just such a simple sketch is enough to explain such a complicated idea and saying, okay, this is basically what's going to happen. Mm. Okay, and how, oh, I'm skipping forward. So then we have an example here, how you can do that in software engineering. So if you have to talk about uh, complicated uh, concepts, then maybe it's uh, easiest to use simple analogies. So here you see an example of 
explaining how a controlled versus an autonomous system behaves uh, using the analogy of a fish tank and open sea. In architecture, it's very difficult to prototype. Like, how do you prototype something that is a building? <laughs> um, so what architects do a lot is they use physical models. And here you can see um, uh, explorations, and it's actually just like a, uh, it's a fraction of the models that, uh, that have been made to develop the shape of a building that was executed in, uh, in Istanbul. Um, and in the end, looks something like this. Uh, so you have these different um, volumes stuck on top of each other uh, with different program inside. Uh, so you can see here that actually a physical model uh, allows you um, to, to push the design. Basically, if you would try to draw this on a flat piece of paper, that's almost impossible. You would never re uh, achieve the same result. Um, so, how can you prototype in software development? Well, basically, you can prototype by doing demos. Uh, here you see a picture from DockerCon uh, this year in Barcelona, uh, where together with uh, Container Solutions, uh, we worked on a project to showcase um, Cisco's microservices platform, Mante. And you see here this, uh, this wheel, of, wheel of fortune and uh, the screen connected to it with an uh, interface. Um, so the, the Wheel of Fortune is an IoT device and it uh, counts the clicks. Um, I don't want to go too much into details about like, the technical aspects of it. I'm going to show you uh, a short video how it works. Uh, so when you spin the wheel, the user interface shows actually what's happening in the backend. Hope the video works. It doesn't. Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, then I'm going to skip the video. Um, and go on. And that doesn't work else. Okay. Okay, another... Um, Another useful aspect uh, where you can use uh, visuals is to understand the context that you're operating in. So every building sits on a specific site. And at the beginning of each project, architects actually go on the site and analyze the site and try to understand what's happening in the surrounding. So this is an example of a very early sketch in a project where you just have a look at the, uh, the light conditions, where is the sun coming from, um, and depending on, uh, on these conditions, architects would decide where on the site to locate the building, um, how should the building be oriented towards the sun, because for example, you want to have light in your bedroom in the morning and sun in the living room in the afternoon. And this is also relevant uh, for uh, software engineering. Uh, you don't uh, place your software on a specific site, but when you're developing a product, it's going to operate or it's going to be released into a specific ecosystem. So this is an example of a project that, uh, where we tried to visualize um, the ecosystem of software development as a supply chain and placed all the different um, uh, tools and players on this map. And this map was used during a workshop uh, with uh, Cisco here uh, to help them to understand where on this map the products are that they're developing. So here in the picture you see Ken Owens, the CTO of uh, Cisco Cloud, putting a sticker on the map and saying, okay, this is where I believe our product uh, sits in this uh, ecosystem. It's a very powerful visual tool to start a conversation and to get an understanding of the context that you operate in. Um, visuals are extremely helpful when talking about complexity. Here you see uh, several diagrams trying to explain or 
not trying to explain, but actually explaining very well where certain parts of a program uh, is located. So, for example, um, let's see, here on the bottom, this is the diagram showing all of the cores, so all the vertical communication uh, in the building, or here all of the parking lots and so forth. So again, um, using just like simple diagrams, you can visualize uh, very complex information. And to be honest, like how would you do, do this differently? Like, would you be able ever to talk about this? Like, can you write a text about it? Um, I think it would be <laughs> more challenging <laughs> than making that visual. Um, so we do, si we do similar stuff uh, for software development where we try to visualize, so we, no, again, we, not, we don't try, why am I saying we try, we actually do visualize uh, this complex system. So um, I assume that uh, at least some people in the no audience know what, uh, what Mesos is and um, how a Mesos cluster works. Uh, if not, then this is a diagram that explains. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's clear now. Uh, so this is a <laughs> this is a message cluster with an Elasticsearch cluster on top running. Um, but the point is that uh, here, actually, in a quite simple graphic uh, that is dense with information, we are able to to communicate a very uh, complex uh, system. Uh, what if it gets even more complicated? So architects um, use so-called uh, exploded axonometrics. So you can see here, uh, this drawing is basically each layer of the building and just separated from each other. And this way you can show um, information that is uh, sitting on each layer, but also how this information is connected to each other. Um, I believe that actually in software development you can do this even better because if you look at this, this actually looks quite busy and you would have to zoom in and um, and have a, a, you know, just spend a lot of time on trying to understand what's going on here, which is not a bad thing, but actually maybe there is almost like an overload of information. Um, in software development, I think because you can actually operate with uh, interactive user interfaces, this is almost easier and um, <coughs> uh, and uh, more. Um, okay, I don't know what I want to say. It's easier. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is an example of a visualization of, uh, of a running system of uh, microservices. And by turning on and off different layers of information, you can actually see how your system is behaving at a certain uh, moment of time. So as an example here, you see like all of the services that are running and how these services are performing, on which uh, uh, clouds or uh, on-premise on they are located, um, the connections between the services, uh, actually even how much you pay for each component, um, there's an alert layer, um, there's a hardware layer where you can see each uh, of the services uh, being located on a specific machine. Um, but just to, uh, so here again, this layering of information uh, allows you to see many different uh, connections. And I think there's, there's quite a lot of power in overlapping different types of information because the moment you start overlapping information, you see, um, uh, you see connections that maybe haven't been visible before. The closer you, uh, we get to the construction, the more detailed the drawings become. So this is probably what most people think about when you say ar architectural drawing, or like uh, in the world of architects that build buildings, because I think in software engineering probably you think about something else. Um, but these drawings, they become actually quite detailed. So slowly we're moving towards drawings that are supposed to allow someone to actually take that thing and build it in the end. So you see that there's, it, it basically starts looking like a real building. There are rooms, like you show doors. Uh, there's an auditorium, there's sections, elevations, so all kinds of different visuals. Um, 
when it gets complicated, like here, this is like a, a, a this is a structure um, of that building that I was showing also before with all of the different foam models. Uh, so in the end, uh, they decided for a version of this, but this was extremely difficult to execute because, um, I mean, I think it's quite obvious. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> and uh, Istanbul is, I think, uh, earthquake zone five or something like this. Uh, so normally you should not be even allowed to build something like that. So it had to be uh, super secure. Uh, so the architects actually had to make a 3D model of the whole structure so that the structural engineers were able to even get an understanding of like what's going on there. So you actually like if you if you think about this um, in in software engineering, you're also creating quite uh, detailed uh, visuals about the architecture of the systems that you're designing, and uh, we see that it's very powerful to show this kind of complicated uh, visuals in a step-to-step -step, uh, fashion. So here you can see how we're slowly building up and explaining what mantle and shipped are about and how the whole system is built and how everything is connected. Even we can show on these diagrams where the different uh, stakeholders are located and when in the process they are involved. And the last but not least, we have um, visuals that have a much more commercial purpose and they're there to actually support to sell the product. Uh, in architecture, these are uh, 3D visualizations. Um, and they don't have so much uh, a purpose to facilitate the design. They're really much more there to communicate to clients or investors, um, to future users, to convince everyone that the future is going to be amazing. Yes, yeah, so these. Um, these buildings here, they're just uh, going to look like this and there's going to be these like, fancy lights and everything is going to be beautiful. Um, and uh, I have to say that there's like a, quite a big uh, chunk of the budget in architecture going towards uh, these kind of visuals. Uh, it's like the marketing of architecture. So how do you do that in software engineering, or like what's the uh, what's the equivalent here in software engineering? Um, I believe that it's the brand of the products uh, because you you don't have to um, like convince any clients with the brand. But uh, the problem that you're facing as uh, software developers is that uh, you have to somehow talk about your products, and at some point adoption needs to happen. So the, the, mo the earlier you start talking about the product and create awareness about the product, the, the earlier you will have people start using it. Um, so this is an example of, um, of a, 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 like a brand family that we created for uh, Mesos Frameworks. Uh, we're collaborating on this with Container Solutions and uh, these guys basically on average um, have a one new framework per month. Uh, so we were a bit like, okay, so now every month we have to come up with a new logo and a new website and a new brand and actually they're all one family. So I said, okay, why not automate uh, the branding? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, working with uh, software developers, so that would be actually uh, feasible. So we went, we just, like we developed a system, we came up with some rules. And we made a logo generator. So basically here... So basically here I can come and say my framework name. So can someone give me a good framework name? Software Circus. Software Circus. I think it's too long. Okay. Software Circus. And then we can just start Creating, <laughs> oops, okay, yeah, the alignment is a bit off, it's still a prototype. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and you can uh, save them and download them as an SVG. Um, so it's fully automated. We have a template for the website and uh, 
So it's very easy. We don't have to do a lot of work each time when the uh, guys get very busy with, with uh, new frameworks. Um, okay, so I showed you all of these examples and I hope that by now it's actually very obvious and clear that visuals can be helpful uh, to facilitate the design and uh, the development process. But just to summarize the benefits. So um, one huge benefit that I see uh, and that is very obvious from our experience is that it helps to uh, develop ideas, it helps you to understand your own and then explore the ideas and uh, take them to the next uh, level. Uh, it supports communication, uh, both inter internally between the development teams, uh, but also externally with third parties or with clients. Um, it is, I would claim that it is a low-cost way to experiment, um, and it helps you to sell your products. Uh, it helps you to talk about your products. It helps you to understand how you can, um, uh, yeah, how you can talk about them. So, if at this point you're thinking, okay, that's all very cool, and maybe we want to do this, but actually, so how? So, I'm going to explain you how we do it. So, you take a developer, uh, in this case, uh, Pin Resnik from Container Solutions. And then you take a nerdy designer, like me, and you give them a whiteboard and some colorful markers, post-its, and then it starts. And then you let, <laughs> you let Pinny talk, and he starts maybe drawing, and then this designer is asking um, some stupid questions maybe, but maybe then later not so stupid questions, and then... Um, and then uh, from all of these conversations and all of these drawings, you actually have new insights, uh, which leads to more drawings, even more drawings, and then even more drawings. And then you invite more people and you explain it to more people and uh, there's a whole conversation. At some point it gets pretty messy, but all of this mess and all of this conversation in the end allows you to go back and to simplify again. And then you can start working on the final visual where everything comes together and then at the end you have like the final product. So it's maybe not that easy, but it's maybe easier than you would think. Uh, the very beginning is just this whiteboard and two people having a conversation and start drawing. Um, so just as a final uh, word, I want to say that I'm not trying to claim that visuals should replace code. Uh, as much as in architecture, visuals do not replace the actual construction of the building or they do not replace the building in the end. But visuals facilitate the whole design process. So I believe that uh, software development can benefit largely from adding visual communication to the process. Because in the end, the soul never thinks without an image, as Aristotle said already centuries ago. Okay, we have time for some questions. Who's up first? Yo, up here. Yeah. Dude, really? <laughs> <laughs> Can I throw this mic now? <laughs> shout, just shout. No, because we're looking downstairs. So no. We like noise. I, I want to share. Can you share a presentation online? Uh, yes, sure. Okay, thanks. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> no question. <laughs> any, any, any questions that are not about sort of like file sharing? <laughs> Nothing. I was. I hope you're oh, yeah. going to eat me. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I think it was very inspirational. Uh, the, I, I spent some time myself trying to visualize a software system uh, as, a, as a product designer myself. The, the problem I have is that they often don't represent physical objects, so trying to make a visual that is self-explanatory is more difficult because you can't just draw perspective and show that something is a wheel, for example. 
do we, do we have tips of, of for making a drawing of a software system more self-explanatory? Mm. Well, I, ho I was hoping that this whole presentation was like a big tip, uh, <laughs> but um, so I mean, I think you 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 and at the beginning you have to ask yourself um, how detailed uh, does the um, does the graphic need to be. So, what is the main message that you have? Like, who is it targeted at? Are you doing it to actually? Um, like as part of your process to understand something, because then I think like there is less um, there, uh, there there is less focus on like the beauty of the graphic, but more focus on the functionality. Um, and if you're actually trying to communicate to someone uh, from outside, then you have to understand who they are and how they're going to look at it, because you're going to talk completely different to um, developers versus to maybe users of your product or to clients. Um, so at the beginning of each uh, visual there is this question like why am I doing this and for whom am I doing it? And I think that's, a, that's like an easy, uh, easy tip that I can, uh, I can give you. Um, and not always, uh, it's not always possible to make visuals self-explanatory. I mean, some of the more complex stuff that I was showing, like the Mesos diagrams, they're actually, they usually, uh, there is some text next to it that explains, no? But um, basically what happens is that the text is supporting the image, or the other way around, the image is supporting the text so that you don't have to write like 10 pages, but you can write a short paragraph. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Okay. It does. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Anybody? Somebody? Yes, it worked. <laughs> um, not really sure what my question is, but... Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I should just ask. join in, you know? <laughs> now, um, uh, do you think that also the actual the code you write is also, in a sense, an image. Um, and do you think there's also space for sort of like combining the code you write to make it more visual, more understandable, rather than just drawing nice pictures? So you're asking if code can be also a visual? Yeah, because it is an image. It is an image, yes, it is visual. Um, I'm more worried about your last sentence where you said not just nice images. Uh, I hope it's clear that it's not just nice images here. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think um, I haven't really thought about this uh, this much. I had this uh, one experience when sitting uh, once at the uh, Container Solutions office and I was looking at my screen and my screen was like full of these like, colorful pictures. I was drawing something in Illustrator looking like at Pinterest, you know, all of this like designy stuff. And then I looked around and everyone else had like a black screen with text. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, okay, my world is so different. That's why we keep like for eight hours every day, we look at a different world. And no wonder we are so different. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I feel like I, I guess like there could be improvement made in like the way tech, uh, code is uh, displayed. Uh, I see that uh, different developers use different color schemes for their code, and some make it like really nice and have a nice color palette. Others just don't care. Um, so. I think this is an interesting project. Actually, we're going maybe to have a look at this and see whether we can revolutionize uh, code. Uh, I'd be interested in that. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all we have time for. Let's get another big round of applause for Marta, please. <laughs>